Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me in this series where I will be addressing what I believe to be the five um, main reasons why people have um, mental health problems, which are namely nutrient deficiency, neurotoxicity, hormone imbalance, um, structural brain damage, and of course, the psychosocial uh, emotional component that can lead to a mental health crisis. In this series, I will be interviewing experts um, on each of these topics who are knowledgeable, have done research, um, and who will hopefully be able to provide you with the information that you need to create your own mental wellness and well being. Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us today. I have my good friend, Sarah Price Hancock joining us. And um, just to give you a little bit of an introduction here, Sarah. Um, Sarah Price, uh, MSCRC, lived for nearly two decades, misdiagnosed with severe mental illness. She went on to graduate with a master's in rehabilitation counseling and an advanced certification in psychiatric rehabilitation. She is a certified rehabilitation counselor who specializes in psychiatric rehabilitation. She worked for four years as an adjunct professor in San Diego State University's internationally recognized rehabilitation counseling program. Uh, Sarah hosted the Emotional Self-Reliance podcast, guest lectures on psychiatric recovery, and develops curriculum enabling people to achieve their fullest potential. And um, I know that one of the things that you've developed recently is your book, Sarah? Oh yes, I do have a copy right here. Ooh, one okay. of the things I love to do is um, I love to teach people how to um, use the skills and education that, that they have or experience, lived experience that they have to uh, obtain employment. And so this is just a little workbook helping yeah. develop pre-employment skills. It's called Daring to Dream, Essential Tools to Find Employment. Okay, so we'll thanks post. for that opportunity to yeah. plug. <laughs> right, you got to plug your own book. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so we will uh, post a link to that. Wonderful. And, yeah, and down below, you know, later on. So we'll get that from you. Um, so just before we get started, I want to let people know that um, Sarah, uh, you might know us. She's got something a little kind of ski wonky going on with her mouth today. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes that's a thing that you deal with. Sometimes it's not it just kind of it comes and goes um but uh i want people to know that sarah who's always lovely and gorgeous <laughs> is Thank also you. under you know underneath this mask of um iatrogenic injury is still like this brilliant person and just you know sometimes mm, she has to you. deal with this this mouth you know thing and difficulty speaking because of her injury so let's get into that can you just tell us a little bit about you know, your history and, and what has led up to where you are now. Thank you, Jocelyn. You know, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to speak with you and all of your, your followers because I really genuinely feel that my experience can help a lot of people to um, find their personal medicine, we'll call it personalized medicine for them that can help them improve uh, their quality of life. I've gone through an entire... Uh, I was 17 years misdiagnosed as uh, my official diagnosis was schizoaffective disorder bipolar type with intermittent catatonia. And so my doctors didn't recognize that what I really had was hepatic encephalopathy. So for 17 years, I cycled, well, through, for 12 years, I cycled through a uh, 37 different combinations of five classes of psychiatric medications. And then um, finally we found a cocktail that worked. Um, so when we found that cocktail and I had learned additional skills um, using a wellness recovery action plan, I was able to go back to school and get my master's degree like you mentioned. Um, but that five years of, you know, stability, more or less kind of stability, um, waned and the medication stopped working. And I was really scared to try a new cocktail of medications because they have me on five different classes and finding ones which 
I did not negatively react to, that I didn't get akathisia from, I didn't get tardive dyskinesia from, um, that I wasn't allergic to for some reason. I have a lot of allergies. Um, got me on this journey of, well, where can I do, what can I do instead? What can I do instead? And I, I had multiple friends who, um, oh, and before I forget, <laughs> I also, during that process of medication, because I cycled through so many different kinds of medications, they uh, gave me shock treatments, or ECT, which stands for electroconvulsive therapy. Um, and so this is um, a delayed neurological sequelae, I think it's called, of electrical injury. So it affects motor movement. And so that's why you're seeing this is dysphoria. It's a speech impediment that's, that's related to um, motor misfunction. So sometimes it's really bad and sometimes it's not as bad. And sometimes I only speak with a very little lisp, which is, I, I like those days, but they're getting to be more few and far between. But um, back to my personal journey, I got, um, I had lots of friends who had gotten interested in the micronutrition. And so I had friends who were telling me, you have to try this micronutrition. Well, I'm sorry, I lived for 17 years being told that I had to be on medication, that I had to uh, take medication for the rest of my life. Um, that without the medication, I would get worse. And as sick as I was, I couldn't imagine getting worse. And so um, I started doing the research because I was desperate. I didn't want to go through the, the hell that I had been through trying to get on the right cocktail for 12 years. And I'd just recently gotten married and I was actually still the last semester of graduate school when this was going on. And so, um, my I didn't want to end up falling out of graduate school in the, my third year. Um, I wanted to finish my degree, so I just started researching. And thank goodness for uh, Bonnie Kaplan that you just interviewed and Julia Rutledge because they are scientific women who do exceptional methodology in their research with randomized controlled trials and whatnot and so uh, I am also a woman of science and so looking at that information really spoke to me and it gave me the idea that maybe maybe something else is going on here despite my psychoform classes and despite my diagnostic classes maybe there's something else going on here that I needed to explore and so I did I got into micronutrition I was able to titrate off of a, really high doses of five classes of medications. Some of the medications, I was not aware that they were actually prescribed over FDA recommendations. So it was very, the titration process was horrific. Um, the withdrawal process um, and then protracted syndrome was just gnarly. Um, and I began to realize that the micronutrition for me personally was great initially. I completely stabilized on it. Um, and then gradually it was becoming less and less effective. I couldn't figure out why. But I just, I was working with a group of people who were working with my doctor. And so they just kept telling my doctor to increase the dose of the micronutrition. So I did. And that always worked. And I would get stability for quite a long time. When I say quite a long time, I'm saying I'm saying several weeks. Um, but by the end of being on micronutrition, um, about 18 months of micronutrition, I've gone from taking only six capsules to taking uh, 20 capsules a day. Wow! So yeah. it, it was it wasn't realistic. Yeah, uh, like there's not a lot of people who could afford yeah. to buy supplements at that. Yeah, and, and to their credit, I actually, I couldn't afford it. Um, and I, the company that had, um, the company that had heard about me, um, they were very kind. 
Um, and Tony Stefan actually was sending me free uh, stuff um, because he knew that I couldn't afford it. Um, and he did that for a couple of months and I was very grateful for that. But we realized that um, I, I, I couldn't sustain it and I was burning through it. I would get, you know, the set, the relief of symptoms for about two hours and then it was like my body had already burnt through the nutrition and so I'd need another dose. Um, we were very careful with my doctor mapping out what time I was taking things, what time the symptoms you know, came back and blah, blah, blah. So it was very, very well regulated um, with the people at True Hope and Micronutrient Support and my doctor because um, I was not willing to do it without my psychiatrist. And my psychiatrist... I, I went through four different psychiatrists through that titration process because no one was interested in helping someone with my diagnosis get off meds. Um, but um, once I was able to present all of the research to my doctor, to her credit, um, a wonderful uh, psychiatric uh, maternal psychiatrist, she calls herself, I think, a maternal psychiatrist because she deals primarily with women, especially women in pregnancy. I wasn't pregnant, but she does, she recognizes the role that hormones play in uh, illness. And so she um, worked really closely with me reading the research. I love her for that. Um, and also working with the micronutrient support to better understand titration and withdrawal because she had never titrated anyone off the medications before, especially with my diagnosis. Yeah. So we, but we isn't, that, isn't that kind of funny? I honestly, sorry to interrupt, but just to think about that you have somebody who's prescribing these meds and has no experience getting anybody off of medication. It just seems yeah. so ironic, but that really is common in yeah. this field of psychiatry they know how to put people on well yeah they just have no it, idea you know, it, it, it was interesting because she uh see this is a dystonia it gets triggered every once in a while she was um to her credit she was actually very open-minded about it mm -hmm. um and she was very interested in the research and um unfortunately there's not much research out there about uh about titration and supporting the body enzymatically through um, titration process. But, but True Hope um, worked, uh, one of the psychiatrists who originally did some of the original research on micronutrition, um, one of the formulas was uh, Dr. Charles Popper, who is actually um, a psychiatrist. I believe he was the director of psychiatry at the time, I believe it was Harvard. Um, and he did, he did randomize, or he did, he did controlled uh, trials with it. And the interesting thing is he had learned how to support the body through the titration process to facilitate these trials so that it wasn't competing with the withdrawal syndrome or the protracted withdrawal or the protracted syndrome and getting that confused with the effects of the micronutrition. So he actually coached my psychiatrist uh, through, you know, how often I would need to support my body enzymatically um, to reduce the symptoms of withdrawal by using um, protein isolate. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that saved me. I, I don't think I would have been able I had a hard enough time going through withdrawal, but having his guidance and knowing that I needed a protein isolate shake every two hours um, or do it prophylactically if I knew I was going to start exercising or do something that would make me sweat, get caught outside or, or, or you know, wanted to go for a hike or something, I would take additional, uh, I would take additional protein isolate before I did something. Um, and it got to the point where I was just carrying this bottle of isolated protein shake um, with me everywhere. I blended up in the morning. I had a double, double uh, isolated or double insulated container. And then I would be able to go everywhere. I even enjoyed a vacation during withdrawal, which is unheard of. I enjoyed going to 
the county fair, which is unheard of, you know, getting out of my house during yeah. withdrawal, but it was because my body was properly supported. And we're talking withdrawal from multiple medications. Five classes of medications. I withdraw from benzos. Wow. Um, it was a, I was on a very high dose of an SSRI. I was on a mood stabilizer and I was on um, a Z drug for sleep. And I was on um, uh, antipsychotic, very high doses of an antipsychotic. Okay. So my doctor is like, wow, if this works for you, it could work for anyone. Cause she'd <laughs> never, she'd never done this before. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people watching, obviously, they're going to relate to aspects of your story. I mean, being polydrugged, you know, on various medications, having the yeah. drugs not work, trying to find someone who can help them get off these medications when they don't work, and coming up blank, really, um, is unfortunately such a common story. And just to kind of go back a little bit, I think what for me um, was um, heartening to hear about your story is that Sarah, you know, has a very impressive, you know, sort of track record. If you listen to her, I mean, she, wow, she was oh, on like all these you. drugs with these major mental health diagnoses and, yeah. you know, got her master's. But um, also I think it's important for people to understand it's, you weren't always like this high functioning person. You, before that, you were really, um, you were in a dark, dark place. You, I was you were, in a very dark place. Yeah, you For were not 12 years, I was basically uh, completely isolated. I was in and out of the hospital about every three to five weeks. My dad says that's being generous because sometimes I would come out and I would be back in the hospital within 72 hours or even 48 hours. Because um, the psychosis and the command hallucinations and the panic attacks and the akathisia from rotating through all of these medications because they would just cold turkey me from an entire cocktail and start me the next day on a new cocktail. Um, it really was neurological torture. Oh, yeah. Um, because uh, and, they didn't uh, understand. They didn't understand that um, these drugs do cause dependence. And then when you take a person off one class of medication or one specific medication that's addressing these specific class of neurotransmitter receptors, and then you put me on a different uh, medication of the same class but addresses different receptors, I mean, those receptors like are starting to freak out because they used to be supported and now they're not getting support. So it was right. just- and, and it makes me wonder how many people yeah. out there aren't necessarily dealing with, you know, a worsening mental illness so much as just like constant states of drug withdrawal from being, yeah. cause that's really is protocol. If, if, if a drug's not working, they just switch you from one to the next. And it's like, yeah. that's not how our bodies work. Like it yeah. seems like common sense, but unfortunately it's not applied. Um, in practice. So you were off and on all these meds and you mentioned yeah. earlier that you had hep hepatic encephalopathy and could you explain why and kind of what that is for people who, who don't? Oh know? sure. So yeah. the reason that my body was needing higher and higher doses of the micronutrition to maintain stability was because I actually had a liver problem um, I had been overprescribed antibiotics growing up. And so the natural yeast or fungus in your gut, um, we're not sure if it is candida, but it could be some kind of candida or fungal, something that was naturally occurring in the gut. It was totally went out of control um, by the overprescribing of antibiotics through my childhood because I had chronic bronchitis and chronic sinusitis from really bad allergies. Mm. And so it, it outgrew the natural location in my stomach and the very next organ is the liver. And so it grew into my liver and then my liver gradually had difficulty because it couldn't, the, it wasn't necessarily the actual yeast or whatever it was. We just know that it react, it we just know that it was some kind of fungus or yeast because it positively reacted to antifungal treatment. Um, but there's no like biopsy or anything that we could do to really test for it. Um, my doctor, basically, he, he, when I found my doctor in 2017, um, I searched him out because 
the true hope people were saying that um, the micronutrition was being um, not absorbed properly because I had an overgrowth of candida. That was the first time I'd ever heard about that. My psychiatrist, she kind of put mute, looked at me and she's like, Oh, like candida. <laughs> yeah, she's like, what? <laughs> right. And the lady on the support line, she's like, are you familiar with candida? And the lady's like, well, like thrush and uh, vaginitis, but that's about <laughs> it. And so it was just really interesting because we were educating my psychiatrist at the same time. And so there's, I can give you the link. There's a really interesting article um, in a medical hypothesis journal about how candida can cause um, neurological problems. And it just really depending on where the person's um, neurologic vulnerabilities lay, um, it can cause uh, autism, it could cause psychiatric illnesses, uh, and or it could also cause uh, dementia or Alzheimer type uh, symptom. Right. And, and that's one of really, I feel like, um, the gut biome and all of that. I mean, we really haven't scratched the surface, uh, with our understanding of this, but I feel like if anybody out there has some expertise in this, Sarah, it's you because you have researched this so much. You have worked with researchers and doctors who are experts, you know, in this field, or, or at least in this burgeoning field of science. Um, and so I, 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 that's one of the reasons um, why I want you on here so that you can share some of, of that knowledge. Because I think, if I understand correctly, what we're really talking about here is neurotoxicity. We're talking yeah. about inflammation around your brain yeah. from this, this yeast overgrowth, this, this, this microbiome imbalance that led from you being a, a normal kind of girl with maybe some anxiety going to college to all of a sudden just one day seeing things and hearing things that were there, there. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and, and I think this is something that's kind of getting out there. There's the, the brain on fire, the girl that she's, she's kind of talked about this. They even made a, a movie about her on Netflix that this is, yeah. look, this is a real thing. Something as simple as taking too many antibiotics could yeah. lead. And, and I'm not trying to freak people out there or, you know, but I, I just want yeah. people to be aware of this as a potential cause. And, and yeah, just because there's things yeah. you can do to better, better that, treat it that are yeah. simple, right, as opposed to in your case, unfortunately, adding in medications, which are also really neurotoxic. And then especially if you don't need them. Or exactly. Yeah. And compounding yeah. and compounding, compounding to the pump to the point where then gee, none of these things are working. Let's electrocute Sarah's brain because we don't have any other options left. And 450 volts, baby. Let's do it 116 times. Oh my goodness. My yeah, gracious. Sorry. I mean, yes, people, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, they do still shock people's brains. This isn't something in movies. This is happening and it's actually happening more and more. Yeah. yeah. It's becoming more popular as these drugs become, it's, you know, as doctors become more and more aware of how ineffective they are at treating yeah. a lot of these problems. And uh, a lot of the reasons why these drugs are ineffective at treating the problems is because they're not treating the source. Um, yeah. Sarah, you actually, in your, you know, intro that you gave us discussing your story, you probably touched on every single um, uh, one of the five points <laughs> that yeah. I am discussing in this series of what the possible causes of um, mental illness are, which is, I mean, you've discussed neurotoxicity. Uh, you mentioned yeah. working with someone on, on balancing your hormones. Uh, obviously, we're discussing a brain injury from the shock therapy, which is yeah. bludgeoned to the brain. Um, it's and, the and equivalent for- of 73, one treatment is the equivalent of dropping a 73 pound weight, or uh, I think that's 33 kilograms weight onto the head from a foot or 30 centimeters above it. And I had that 116 times. So I essentially I'm living with a repetitive head injury like a football player or a hockey right. player. Right. And you're kind of a walking miracle because um, you, I guess you. I would say in spite of the ECT, you have yeah. healed like so extraordinarily from the years of medications. Um, yeah. So anyway, sorry to kind of like backtrack. I just kind of want to okay. give people that. So um, yeah. What what would you like people to understand about how the gut biome affects mental health and, and maybe what 
they can do if they feel like this is a, you know, something they want to investigate. Certainly. And it is wise to investigate it because if you've ever had an antibiotic in your life, it's a broad spectrum antibiotic. And so that will knock out even the healthy bacteria in your body, not just the unhealthy bacteria in your body. And so um, it's actually um, important to maintain a balance between healthy bacteria and the fungal yeast because we need all of that in a good proportion. We need the right kinds of bacteria and the right kinds of yeast and the, anything to any excess is bad. So for example, I have friends who uh, did pandas treatment um, because they had problems with, um, they recognized early in life that they did uh, better on a mild antibiotic, but then the problem was as they got older, then they pushed their gut biome to fungal. And so then they started having problems with the candidal aspects and getting the psychiatric symptoms. And it's just a spectrum of severity. So it might just be initially anxiety, um, it might progress to depression, it might progress to insomnia and depression, and then progresses to hypomania, and then it progresses to mixed mania, and then it can progress to psychosis. But, but the fungal yeast family grows exponentially slower than bacteria. So you could eat something while you're on this antibiotic and not feel, you know, suddenly three days later, you're having symptoms of anxiety and you're like, what? No one ever asked, what did I eat three days ago? Yeah. <laughs> but it's important to remember, like I, I did the, the Candido program for two years. Um, and then I had, I participated in the American Gut Biome Project um, and discovered that I have a family of bacteria in my gut. Um, I had, it was 73% of that family of bacteria. And um, it was very, uh, compared to the American population, the people who ate the same kind of diet that I did, which is basically plant-based, that group of a uh, family of bacteria is actually very common in people who live with autism. So I found that very interesting because the normal population for that pack family of bacteria is normally between 42 to 51 percent or something the research said and I was at 71.3 or 73.1 percent of that kind of bacteria in my gut. So the interesting thing earlier you were mentioning about how inflammation was causing these problems, and I wanted to just clarify, because it's not really inflammation, it's more ag agitation. Because I can't take like an ibuprofen and relieve symptoms of my depression, right? But I have to address the irritants that are aggravating my, um, my brain and my central nervous system. So for example, with candida, when uh, candida, all of the different kinds of candida there are, when it grows, it actually produces 20 different alcohol byproducts. And the interesting thing is that the family of bacteria also produce some of the same alcohol byproducts. We're talking acetone, we're talking aldehyde. And so basically my brain was marinating in alcohol, even though I personally had never drunk a drop of alcohol in my life. <laughs> so it was interesting um, because we all have taken antibiotics, right? And when we take antibiotics, no one thinks, oh, I should cut out all of the sugar while I'm on this antibiotic, or um, I really need to, you know, two, after, two hours or four hours after I take my antibiotic, I need to take a probiotic. We weren't taught that in the 80s and 90s or early 2000s. Uh, well, we're not taught that now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we don't remember, you know, there's a, the gut biome is a very delicate balance. And so we have to really toe the line and walk that tightrope, especially when you get off track. Right. Well, and I think um, people, particularly those in, in benzo withdrawal or that kind of sensitivity yeah. Yeah. are becoming a, very much aware of that because within the support communities, people will agonize over taking an antibiotic or not. Because yeah. we know that with the sensitivities that we have to benzodiazepines, which are similar to alcohol in, in how they work, uh -huh. that taking an antibiotic can really aggravate somebody's symptoms. It can really set them off and set yeah. them back, um, you know, for weeks 
or yeah. uh, who knows how long, just, just because they're trying mm -hmm. to, and there are, there are people who are trying to treat things like, like, you know, cellulitis and MRSA. Yeah, <laughs> and they're like, should yeah. I take an antibiotic? Because they, it's We're just like, that bad. Yeah. So when that happens, my doctor, I had an awesome doctor. I'm so sad he moved, but my doctor actually concurrently prescribed, he prescribed both the antibiotic because I actually got a kidney infection while I was going through the candida protocol. I got a kidney infection, which you cannot ignore a kidney infection, right? You have to No, you have to take, yeah, you have to do something. Yeah, exactly. So he prescribed obviously the antibiotic for the kidney infection, but he also concurrently prescribed uh, two different antifungals. And so we were working really carefully, timing the medications and also timing the probiotics. And I had to basically go on only uh, vegetables and brown rice and like chicken and poultry for that period of time because I couldn't have anything that would have any additional sugars um, because we couldn't afford to feed the the candida problem that I have. Because basically, because I lived with it for 44 years before it was diagnosed, or 42 years before it was diagnosed, now my body's always kind of leaving, leaning a little bit fungal. So I have to still work really hard at eating foods that are not gonna push me over the edge. And it's interesting, because if I cheat on this diet, <laughs> some, like <laughs> depends on what I eat accidentally or on purpose. Um, <laughs> It could be like the very next day, I will wake up just crying my eyes out, or I will wake up with really severe anxiety. And I really think that part of my reason my withdrawal period was a success, um, and that I was not only because of the, um, what's it called, was not only because of knowing how to support my body enzymatically, but it was also because I had cleaned up my diet. And so I wasn't having a lot of these processed things like maltodextrin, maltose, uh, or isomalt, or any of the uh, dextrose, or any of these things like xanthan gum that, that my body uh, gets aggravated by. Because those all of the things I listed actually feed candida. And so my when I ate foods like that, I didn't know why my withdrawal symptoms would flare. And it was because I was eating foods that were feeding the candida. Um, so like even bread, it's very difficult to find bread that doesn't have yeast in it and that doesn't have some form of malted barley flour in it. Um, so I had to make my own like soda bread and yeah. muffins. And, I've, and I'm and familiar like with that, that too. I've learned how yeah. to make Irish soda bread from organic yeah wheat that doesn't have other stuff in it um uh -huh. and you know what maybe what we can do is i'll post a, a recipe down below or something that if anybody's interested in, in pursuing this um because i think a, a lot of people again in withdrawal there's something about what these medications do um and, and of course those who are dealing with being foxed things like that it just does yeah. something to your gut and we are learning that the gut does is so um, involved in producing neurotransmitters or just various things that we do need for mental health stability. Yeah. Um, so if somebody, like for instance, you you worked, the doctor you worked with, it's Candida MD. Um, so you've obviously had a, a multi-pronged approach. You've, we've discussed that you've yeah. addressed nutrient support. Yeah. You know, with the company, there's various companies that do a similar yeah. products um which i discussed again in my last video um yeah. and i harped on diet you know for various reasons but you, for you yeah. diet wasn't just about nutrition diet was about balancing your gut biome yeah um, yeah that was and, integral yeah and, and unfortunately because my body was leaning so far fungal i couldn't use normal normal things that other people use like kombucha or yogurt or those kinds of things because those things actually feed fungal. Right. And and now that I've learned this from you, I look back on my own history and withdrawal and make, oh, you know, that makes a lot of sense because all these things that I had learned, I, I was very much into health and nutrition. I used to make my own kombucha. I would make my own sauerkraut, all these things. And yeah. people are like, oh, well, you know, to get healthy, you need to take probiotics, you need to eat probiotic foods, fermented foods, and da, 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 da. And I could not tolerate those things. When I was oh, in withdrawal, really? no, I, I couldn't tolerate them. And so that leads me to believe that even though maybe mine wasn't totally based on antibiotics, although 
I had been put on a lot of antibiotics when I was growing up, um, but I had worked to restore my gut balance before all of this craziness happened. And, and I believe I had, but I think I was so sensitive still from growing up that way um, that, you know, the withdrawal and whatever just triggered that. And I had horrible gut issues. A lot of people do. We get what's called benzo belly. Oh, yeah. um, and again, after talking with you and learning from you, I looked back on my experience where I started working with a functional medicine doctor and I got so much better so quickly. So quickly. And, yeah. yeah at, and at the time I thought, oh, well, it was because of the nutritional support. It was because the high protein diet and he balanced my blood sugar. And, and I do believe all of that is important. That's one aspect of this approach. But yeah. I realized, oh, you know what? When I started working with my doctor, he put me on a gut balanced diet. And there, there's lots of different protocols out there, yeah. but I started and I, I religiously did this diet and I did it longer than he actually, and, and more strictly, I would say than even he recommended, I did it for a whole month. And that's when I was doing so well post withdrawal. And, and, and what people need to understand is I was not doing well post withdrawal. I was having a very difficult time. Um, all of a sudden I was sleeping seven to eight hours. I was, I was yeah. just doing so well and so many, I wasn't perfect, but I, it was night yeah. and day. Yeah. And when I stopped doing the gut protocol about a month later, I was still doing the other things which were very helpful, yeah. but I started to regress and yeah. I started having problems again. And now looking back, I realized, oh, you know, so then I started looking for other things and other supplements. Then I started on a ketogenic diet, which was super helpful. Again, took me to that next level of healing. Um, but then I wasn't as careful with that. I was eating a lot of foods that had erythritol and and xylitol those and, alcohols yeah. man once you once your central nervous system has been aggravated by the by the meds um it's like it, it's it just kind of makes our central nervous system more vulnerable to these alcohols for some reason and so so yeah i mean yeah. i've talked to people who are in benzo withdrawal and i'm like cut out all of that you know all of this, all the sugars, cut out these things because your body will create alcohols. Yes. Even like sorbitol, I, I was for a while, they were telling me just do like broad spectrum amino acids to support your body. And so I'd find these nicely flavored things, but they were flavored with sorbitol. They're all, yeah. And they create so, alcohols in, in your body. So then, so then I would have, it wasn't back. working. It was just like, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So I, I honestly, so much having, to learn. <laughs> like I'm not really focusing as much probably as I should be on my gut biome right now. Cause I'm dealing with a son who's also disabled and we have we did focus with him on his gut biome and maybe i'll talk yeah. a bit more about that in my own personal update i want this to be about you not me but mm -hmm. um but we did notice a, a, a huge difference with uh nathaniel when we started working with the doctor on his gut biome and treating um potential yeast overgrowth and again for him that was probably only one part of what he needs it exactly. helped. It's not, it's not the whole solution, but boy, did it make a difference. And, and it did help us to recognize, okay, this is really a huge component in healing from any sort of illness. You know, you make a very excellent point. I think so often we've been conditioned to think that it's just one thing. We, all we have to do is get one thing right and everything else will fall into place. Everything else will get better. And so often it's a cumulative effect. It's multiple things that are going on. So for example, when I got onto the Candida protocol um, with a Candida MD, I did that protocol religiously. I mean, I was like, just nailed it. But the interesting thing was, I was I'd gotten better, but I still had problems with brain fog. I still had problems with, um, bouts of anger and difficulty concentrating and sleeping well so then he's like well then we need to look at like a case in allergy or a case in sensitivity because it's not really an allergy because my throat didn't close up right but it's like dr um dr pfeiffer was uh he was president of the um, it's backwards. He was president. Of, no, I, it uh, looks good for me. I can see Oh, it. good. Okay. <laughs> he was president of um, the Princeton Brain and Bio Center back in the 80s. And he had an orthomolecular approach to uh, psychiatry. And orthomolecular so, meaning basically nutrition? 
Yeah, nutrition. Um, yeah, nutrition. And so, for example, if I can just read this really quickly, yeah. he, uh, he, in this book, he lists the causes of uh, schizophrenia, and he's classified them as well-known, less well-known, and almost unknown. And the interesting thing about this, he lists 29 things that are causes of schizophrenia. And then working with my other doctor, he was like, well, this is a spectrum disorder of mental health. So depending on where the person's weaknesses or vulnerabilities are in their own body, they're going to either get OCD or a different form of anxiety, panic attacks or depression. And then as it continues to evolve, as those neurotoxicity continues to grow, then they'll have additional symptoms and additional illnesses. So he says, uh, dementia paralytica, these are the well-known causes of schizophrenia, of uh, symptoms of schizophrenia. Dementia, polygra, porphyria, hypothyroidism, drug intoxications, homeocysteria, I'm not even saying this step right, <laughs> uh, folic acid or vitamin B12 deficiency, sleep deprivation, heavy metal toxicity. Those are the well-known causes. Well, if you look at that, not a single one of them would be addressed by a neuroleptic. Meaning it's not a serotonin imbalance. It's not a dopamine imbalance. Yeah, it's not a dopamine imbalance. Okay, so then the less well-known are hypoglycemia, psychomotor epilepsy, cerebral allergy, which would be like the casein allergy or the gluten allergy. So, the, so I actually took it to the next level of healing when I was on the candido diet that I'm still doing. I also eliminated dairy because case and allergy or sensitivity was a thing for me. And then I went a step beyond that because um, I was still having problems with a like, cognitive fog and stuff. And uh, so I went a step beyond that and later uh, eliminated gluten as well. And my goodness, I can think more clearly. Um, <laughs> histopenia, copper excess, uh, histidelia, Pyroluria, Wilson's disease actually is also a copper excess. Um, chronic candida infection, bam, right there, written about in the 80s. Uh, Huntington's chorea. So those are the those are the well-known and less well-known. And then the almost unknown uh, prostaglandins, which is an imbalance in phospholipids. Mm -hmm. So all of these things would be addressed with unique treatments, different treatments. Right. And so the, each person has to find out what's their individual cause for their symptoms. Right. Um, uh, for you, I mean, I know the main one really uh, was the candida or, you know, the, the gut bile imbalance. And, and yeah. once you started treating that, I believe in three days, basically, yeah. your I, mental illness cleared up. I like, went from being completely psychotic. <laughs> completely psychotic because <laughs> I had a kid I had a I had a kidney infection so I was completely psychotic on the antibiotic and my psychiatrist was like so this is when we put you back on meds and I was like uh no not gonna happen and she's like well then let's do TMS well then we gotta put you back on meds you you're seeing someone in the room with me right now I'm like actually there are six of us we're having a nice conversation <laughs> but what I found, because uh, we were talking with the micronutrient support people, and they're like, you really, really need to investigate uh, candida because the candida, you know, she wasn't having these problems until she was put on the antibiotic. Mm -hmm. That was the key because I had been so stable until I was put on the antibiotic, which destroyed my gut biome. And then my body could not absorb the nutrition that I was getting. So you got stable off of medications. Yeah, I got stable even Awesome. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that amazing? And and you had had ECT up to this point too. I mean, it's not like you weren't dealing with injury at that point yeah. as well. I had, I, had a, I quit ECT against medical advice in 2009. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and so oh, um, as you, so it's almost like I'm, I'm kind of going backwards here, but you, you started putting these pieces of the puzzle together for your healing. Uh, you started with the nutrient support you, and then you kind of moved on to the diet and addressing the candida. I believe you also did um, NAD therapy, correct? 
which yes it's it's it is a type of nad therapy it's called neuro recover and the, it's unique from just nad because it has four uh targeted amino acids in it and they're actually such a small dose it's less than in a single almond but it's four specific amino acids and that actually uh, when i did the neuro recover it's an infusion and it actually ended my protracted symptoms and so that's I was, amazing and yeah. so neuro recover it's kind of what it says but basically what it's doing it's addressing neurological damage it's yeah. right. And I'm not an expert in this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it's going in, it's targeting this micro, just tiny, tiny, like you said, nutrient kind of amino therapy um, to your brain and helping to repair the damage that's been repairing those neurons, correct? Well, we, we don't know exactly how it works, so we can't say it's doing okay. this or it's doing that. Um, they are looking at investigating uh, it clinically, um, but it's been used. Um, since the late 90s, I believe, it began, uh, there was a doctor named Dr. William Hitt who was in T Tijuana. And then my doctor trained with Dr. Hitt. Um, my doctor's name is Dr. John Humiston. Um, I worked with him for two years and then he was impressed with my knowledge and understanding of the subject. And then after I was treated, he actually hired me to be a researcher with him. So I had the opportunity to, um, really be able to see uh, the effects of how there's, there's five different formulations of the NeuroRecover. Each formulation uh, targets a specific cluster of neurotransmitter receptors, we suspect. Um, and so it was really interesting because we would get an entire medical history of these patients, which would include all of the medications that they'd ever been on that they could remember. And then uh, what I was in charge of doing was uh, and identifying the class of, or the, the neurotransmitter cluster. So Dr. Emerson would be like, oh yeah, this is a dopamine drug, this is a serogenic drug, this is you know, a GABA drug. And so knowing whether or not it was an agonist or an antagonist and knowing the strength of the affinity for that receptor, mm -hmm. um, it sounds, you know, it's, it was a lot of fun. I absolutely loved mapping everything for uh, that research project, but it was exciting because he, it would interweave um, the four or five different uh, formulations for the, each of his patients. Um, and so each person had a very unique treatment plan specific to their medical history and also including if they'd ever had any surgeries because the uh, anesthesia uh, would use a specific uh, neuro recover formulation and uh, head trauma also. And so it was very interesting because we would have these people who would, lots of people don't know the medications they're on. So we would have you know, professionals who would come in with tart of this, you know, olfacal tart of dyskinesia, where they're doing blow fish things and sticking their tongue out and they're not aware of it. And I'd be like, you know, when you filled out your medical form, you said you weren't on any antipsychotics. No, I'm not on antipsychotic. I'm like, okay, but I'm looking at the tart of dyskinesia, right? So I'm yeah. like, so I had to make a new intake form for him. With, and which delineated each of the medications because several of these professionals who would walk in with heart of dyskinesia, oftentimes not even recognizing that they had it, um, <laughs> I would say, you, so what did you take for sleep? You said you take something for sleep. What did you take? Oh, well, my doctor had me on, on 50 milligrams of Seroquel. I'm like, right. Okay, so the new, that's an antipsychotic. Yeah. It's like the latest and greatest sleep aid, antipsychotic. Antipsychotic. So yeah. And yeah. so none of these people were aware of what they were being prescribed. They would just assume that their doctor had their best interest in mind. The other, the, you know, the Z drug wasn't working anymore. So we added Seroquel. Let's do it. And they weren't aware of how that could impact their body. Yeah. And I'm sure along with just the the fascination of the scientific inquiry into all this, it was probably very satisfying to be able to help so many people who yeah. were br essentially brain damaged heal in such a short period of time. Cause we're talking about what they go in for a few days a week and do. Um, so the neuro recovery, it would really depend on how recent they had ended or stopped medications. 
um, or if they were still on medications when they started with the uh, infusions. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on how long the person had been on medications, depending on which class of medications they were on, um, people, depending, like if it was opioids, it would be like between uh, 12 and 14 days, mm -hmm. eight, eight and 14 days, um, or if it was heroin or, you know, those kinds of things, all of these psychotropic substances um, for people who had been on other medications or on medications for significantly longer um, it could be you know 16 to 28 days mm -hmm. he didn't know what to do with me because not only had i been on five classes of psych meds for for uh, 17 years he'd never had a patient who'd had 116 ect treatments that's going under anesthesia 116 times general wow. anesthesia. Yeah, and, and honestly never should there be a patient who has had no. 116 ect treatments that shouldn't, even, that shouldn't even be it's thing. not regulated it's not regulated yeah. it's not audited it's not even standardized so my 116 ect treatments were different entirely different than kitty dukakis's type of ect treatments people assume that when they say ect we're all talking about the exact same thing but we're not we just happen to be talking about causing the grand mal seizure with electricity but there's so many different ways to get ect and so many so that they just recently had a class action lawsuit. Well, it was a federal lawsuit against the manufacturer. And the manufacturer came out and listed seven risks of permanent brain damage, permanent memory loss. And each of those risks are actually seven of the several variables that are involved in the administration technique. And so I'm looking through that going, oh my gosh, that one, that one. Well, no wonder I'm so thrashed, you know, because <laughs> I, and, I got the right risks. <laughs> I know, but, and, but miraculously still a brilliant mind. And like I said, doing what you did and completing your master's and working and lecturing and helping people recover themselves. It was from, a lot of hard work. And I yeah. was very blessed in the process. I, I really think that I have a mission to help people to yeah. help them recognize that there are additional ways to treat these symptoms, um, addressing trauma, you know, those, those kinds of things are, are really integral, getting a supportive living environment. One of the ways that I started improving was I got out of the abusive group home where I was living and moved in with a friend's mom. She let me rent a room from her. And she and I had the same belief system and same values and we attended the same church and so every night together we would have we called it family prayer because we weren't family but we would pray together and it was just an entirely different environment in a living situation where I actually had someone who believed in my well-being and my and she, she was a nurse and people were calling her, don't take Sarah, you know, she's been institutionalized for 13 months, she's done shock treatments, she's crazy, you don't want her as a roommate. And she is, she's a single mom who's fought some major battles in her life and she's like, you know what, I really don't care. I knew her as a kid, she's a good kid. I'm a nurse, if I have problems, I'll know how to take care of her, don't worry about me. And I mean, I call her my, I call her my angel of mercy because she gave me a chance when no one else would. And so um, it's just interesting that, you know, sometimes we find ourselves in less than supportive living environments that can play a huge toll on mental health. Yeah. Sometimes even loving families, like I have a very loving family, but we have difficulty communicating with each other and we've learned, you know, how to communicate but well and and even though it's loving family they're not taught they're not instructed necessarily on how to deal with someone who is dealing with a severe mental health crisis and so they may out of love do everything wrong to try and help yeah um, yeah and, and i know that's isn't that family. one of the things that oh i know sorry i was going to say that is one of the things that you address in when you educate people in recovery right is yeah. you address the family component yeah. or the, the support component and educating yeah. them as well because like you said you you may not have ever even gotten to where you are now without somebody yeah. who no. provided that for you 
Yeah, it's true. It's true. And, and I've, I've worked with families. It's, it's difficult because families are like, you know, what happened to my son? What happened to my daughter? They used to be, you know, this person that was riven and that was really, you know, excited about life. And, and I'm like, well, we need to understand that not only are they dealing with the symptoms of the illness, but now they're also dealing with the side effects of the medication. And, you know, those cause apathy, those cause a feeling a disconnect, those cause emotional disconnect and, and difficulty communicating. And they cause just a lot of, a lot of problems. And so being able to um, help people recognize that they're dealing essentially with a brain injured individual um, helps them see their loved one through different eyes it, and that we've been so conditioned to think that this person is genetically defective or they they have some kind of you know mental illness that needs to be diagnosed and medicated because they're chemically off when in reality they're sick yes they're having symptoms yes but there's so many different ways we can address them Right, um, which is the, I think, the unfortunate narrative of the, um, the pharmaceutical approach to mental health, which is yeah. you're defective, you're always going to be defective, therefore you, you need to take these medications the rest of your life. And yeah. it's kind of disempowering because it's like, well, there's nothing you can really do about it. You yeah. can take these meds, but there's nothing you can really do about it because it's just who you are. Whereas yeah. this approach that you have sort of demonstrated throughout your life of, of addressing and, and finding the different puzzle pieces to your own recovery shows that, yes, there are things that might be physically um, wrong with you at that time, but that doesn't mean that's where you have to be because you can take control of your health. You can begin to investigate. You can start applying different methodologies to recover. And so far you've, you've mentioned, I mean, you, you briefly mentioned hormone therapy, hormones, sorry, not hormone therapy. You mentioned yeah. hormones a little bit, prostaglandins play a part in that, that yeah. you mentioned earlier. Um, but you, you addressed uh, your, the brain damage aspect with your yeah. neuro recovery. You addressed the nutrition, you addressed the neurotoxicity with your gut biome and getting off meds was a huge part of addressing the neurotoxicity. Mm -hmm. And now as you share your story and how really your healing journey didn't start with all of that. No. Your healing journey started with the spiritual, the emotional support yeah. aspect. And once you started finding that hope, right, yeah. and, and getting that, um, I know that, that you started sort of implementing your own, I guess, daily program, yeah. right, to, towards recovery that led you to the point where you got your master's and did all these incredible things. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, thank you. That's, yeah, I appreciate I appreciate that. You know, it's been really a journey. Um, and along my journey, I have learned a lot of wellness tools. So when I moved out of the abusive group home into that woman's home, I, I had the biggest chip on my shoulder. As many of us yeah. do. Check that. It's still there. <laughs> I had the biggest Just chip on my shoulder. <laughs> yeah. um, I, had, I thought everyone was against me. Um, I, I had this perspective that I was completely powerless in my situation, a victim to my diagnosis, a victim to terrible genes. Uh, and I had this perspective that, um, that, I mean, I'd grown up in a religious belief that I believed in a God, but, but I honestly thought that he hated me and that I was relegated to live basically a, a ter terrible life in this world. And so um, when I um, was living at this woman's house, I saw this newspaper article in a book called Flourish by Dr. Seligman, Martin Seligman, and he was talking about authentic happiness. And he had this entire classroom of all of his students, and he'd studied, he'd studied how to help people get authentically happy. And I was like, what a cliche phrase, man. That's such a silly phrase. Happy, whatever. Ah, what? <laughs> Not an existent. Yeah, and so, but he had this very specific, very easy thing to do, and he said that he would do it with all the students for the duration of the semester. Um, so, you know, at least 90 days, right? And, and um, he would have them take a self-assessment at the beginning of the semester and a self-assessment at the end of the semester. And on a Likert scale of zero to 10 or one to 10, 
um, everyone would improve by at least an average of three points, even people with clinical depression. And I was like, I am worse than clinically depressed because I have had suicidal command hallucinations for the past 12 years. I'm going to do this and I'm going to prove this guy wrong. I'm going to write him a mean letter and I'm going to tell him he was bad. <laughs> well, so guess what? Yours truly started doing this exercise. Exercise is very simple. It's just writing out three things that went well in that day and explaining why you feel they went well. And by doing that, you are actually, it's more than a gratitude journal. It's like a gratitude journal on steroids because you are identifying why something went well. So that's the clinch of it. That's the linchpin of it. And so little by little, um, when I very first started, I couldn't identify anything that had gone well, even though I had just moved out of the abusive group home. It didn't even register. Like I was that narrow minded and I, my life sinks that everybody hates me, go eat worms. And so I started, you know, the first day it took about 40 minutes to write down three things that went well. I finally wrote down something that was um, flippant. I wrote down, I didn't smack my head on the wall when I got out of bed. And then I realized I had to explain why. And I was like, because I have an amazing sense of balance. <laughs> <laughs> so I was totally flippant, right? But I did this exercise every day. What went well? Why did it go well? And gradually I discovered over, you know, the 90 days that not only did it become easier to come up with those three things, but it became hard to stop at just three. And in looking back at these things, I discovered that everything fell into three categories. Either they went well because I made them go well which made me a change agent, which I'd never considered before. I didn't think I had the power to change my life. Um, they went well because someone around me had fixed things or someone around me had made it go well, which was news to me because I thought everyone hated me. I thought I was the dredge of society because that's how they pe treat people with diagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, so and, and, and probably your disorder at the time fed into that because there is sort of that paranoia yeah. that everybody's out to get you anyway. Well, so that there's that. And there's also everyone's, everyone's constantly uh, assessing. How are you? Did you take your meds? Oh, you, you said that weird. Are you getting, you know, are you seeing things or, uh, or you, your, your, your head is jerking around a little bit, you know, what are you thinking? You know, so everyone is around you is always assessing, is she kind of psychotic right now? What is she listening to? You know, <laughs> that just seems like such a vicious cycle. It's like everybody's it out is. to get me and everybody's out to get me. <laughs> yeah. So. And the hard thing is that people really are like, I can't yeah. tell you how many times people have said, well, do you need to go to the hospital? And I'm like, why am I acting weird? Yeah. Well, no, but normally you go to the hospital when this is happening. Now. Right. Um, so anyway, sorry to interrupt that. So you were saying, so you yeah. realized that you were an agent of change and that other people were other helping people you. Other people were helping yeah. me. And then the third thing was there were a lot of things I could not explain why they went well. And because I was grow, uh, grew up in a religious background, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because I grew up with a, with a spiritual foundation, I began to realize that when, when something went well that I couldn't explain, perhaps it went well because God made it go well. And that was really eye-opening for me because I thought that, that God had turned his back on me. And so um, I took this new understanding. I'm a change agent. People around me are out to help me. And the universe is on my side. And I was like, well, I'm going to do something with this. I'm going to go back to graduate school. <laughs> I'm going to get my life back on track. So That's incredible. And, and your story, Susan, is incredible. And for anybody who wants to kind of just hear Sarah talk more about her story, uh, you can go to her podcast. Um, that's, um, shoot, what was the name of your podcast, Sarah? <laughs> it's the Emotional Self-Reliance Podcast. Thank you. I was thinking Psych Rehab and Recovery, which is your your website and, and we'll yeah. post links to both of those. Okay. Um, but yeah, thank you because I feel like, I don't know, for me at least, I, my understanding of mental illness was not 
it was not very good before I, I sort of started on this journey. I, I got on medications for sleep and yeah, I had some anxiety or whatever, but then with the whole drug injury, then I was di then I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety, but I always kind of eschewed that because I'm like, no, that, that was a misdiagnosis that, you know, yeah. that's not, but the more I look at healing from all these things, the more I realize, you know what, and we hear so much, oh, you have to deal with the emotions. You have to talk about, you know, you have to deal with, but it's true. It, you can't just ignore no. that aspect when it comes to healing, whether it's just from a drug injury because you were on a sleeping pill or what, or because an antibiotic caused it or whatever. And yeah. if you don't address this emotional component, the, the environmental, you know, relationships, the spiritual aspect, um, I, you and I share the same faith, you know, um, if you don't address that, healing is so incomplete it is. and, and it I is. see that you know I'm not a hundred percent healed yet from my drug injuries which include fluoroquinolone antibiotics you know and and antidepressants SNRIs uh, benzodiazepines yeah. um, but boy uh, the healing emotionally the healing spiritually that has taken place has been huge and and I have a long way to go I'm not there yet but yeah. when people say are you healed yes I am right Sarah still yeah has her ski wonky mouth and whatever right, right? Yeah. <laughs> and i still have and we have our things that we deal with but healing from that um takes you to the new the next level when yeah. i learned about this method that you applied which got you from being really what you consider to be the dregs of society yeah. um i went you know obviously i wouldn't turn you but you thought yourself that way to being yeah. a contributing educated professional um I, I started applying that just in, in praying and I wouldn't write it down, but I would say my prayers and I would say, okay, this is what went well, God, and yeah. this is why, right? Um, because yeah. I had tried something similar during my own recovery. I tried writing a gratitude journal every day. It was uh, something that was recommended to me by somebody I was working with on my emotional healing. And honestly, it just made me more depressed. <laughs> I had like, the same problem. I didn't <laughs> feel grateful. I'm like, I should feel grateful for this. I should feel grateful for that. But you but if, don't. And partly I, because your brain can't feel grateful because yeah, that's been injured. But also yeah. because it's like when you can't even function on a day-to-day -day basis, the things you're grateful for are kind of the same things. Well, I'm grateful for my husband and my kids. And I guess I'm grateful that it... I can talk today or, you know, exactly. It's kind I'm of, grateful that I made it to the restroom and I'm grateful that yeah. I have a nice warm blanket to stay in bed with. Right. But it's kind of a pathetic list. And you go and you read through that. It's like, well, that's pathetic. So yeah. I, I love that. What really um, changed everything for you was that additional component of why, why did it go well? And recognizing the forces for good. Um, some of your own power, the powers that be outside of you in your environment, that are yeah. working together for your own good. Yeah. So, and, well, thank you um, for coming today and I don't want to keep you too long, <laughs> when, you know, but um, is there anything else that you wanted to add before we finish up our uh, interview today? Well, I just really sincerely appreciate your, um, your interest in my story and your, um, I appreciate your journey. You've been through a lot too. And I'm grateful that you've taken what you've been through and you've worked to polish it to not only refine and better understand your, your, your situation, but use that to help other people. I think so often as human beings, we see ourselves in these categories and by categories in ourselves, we become isolated. And so often with these things that we experience, we might have very different experiences, but they give us the same human emotions. They, we experience common human emotions. And I think if we as humans begin focusing on the commonalities that we have, especially in our feelings, we will begin to recognize that we are all more alike than different. And we're all in this together. So why not help each other out? Absolutely. And that's probably one of the first things I learned as I was going really through the trenches of hell was right. look at all these people that how, how similar we are, no matter what uh, our race or our religion or our political views, uh, you know, suffering is the great exactly. equalizer, which is actually something Amazing. I say in my book. Suffering mm -hmm. is the great equalizer. And um, you realize, you know, you strip away all that other stuff and you realize we're all people, we're all, you know, the same underneath in a lot of ways and yeah. i just care about the person 
Yeah. Um, hopefully, um, and, and, and I think a lot of people, when they go through something like this, it does change their perspective. They do focus, they shift their focus a little bit, and maybe that's something hopeful for people to look forward to who are really struggling right now, that look, it's bad, yes, if anybody gets it, Sarah gets it, <laughs> how bad it can be. Can but be there, there is a silver lining. There's um, something great that can come from all of this awful stuff. If we let it. Yeah, yeah if we invite it in. Yeah. That's true. So thank you, Sarah, so much for sharing all of your knowledge and, and your journey with us. Today. Thank you, Jocelyn. It was a pleasure being with you today. You too. Bye. Bye.